at, but let me begin by saying, uh, get your notebooks, get ready to hear God's word. Uh, every time we get to get ready to hear God's word, we are excited. We are excited. Um, you know why? Because the Bible says that I am thrilled at the coming of your word. I'm excited, just like that one who is ready to receive or who has found great treasure. Uh, even today, we have found great treasure. And so today, God has brought great treasure to you, great treasure that will propel you into destiny. Uh, and it's important that you get your pad, your notebook, your whatever, wherever you keep your notes, because you know, you can't trust your mind enough. You need to write some of these things down so that you can be, you know, praying about this, but also so that you can go and apply. Uh, wisdom, we like to say here, wisdom is power is only half truth. It's wisdom that is applied that actually is power. I like to begin today from the message version. And uh, from the message version is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5. Uh, somebody say the message version. The message version begins to tell us a very important uh, uh, attribute. 2 Corinthians, okay. Uh, it is one portion of scripture, 1 to 5. But I'm looking for the last verse. Um, yes, where it begins to say, when we've been given a glimpse of the real thing, uh, that's where we'll begin to read from. I see, I see you, Leonard Businge, from uh, abroad. I see you guys, and I celebrate you. Uh, you know, Kezabel. Uh, hey, everybody, everybody. My goodness. Judith, we see you, and we celebrate you. Um, and uh, are we there? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. It begins to say... Around here, that, is that what it says? Okay, it begins to say this. Around here seems like, <laughs> yeah, okay, we'll get to that around here. But let's read from here. Around here seems like, <laughs> I actually like it. Around here seems like a stopover of an unfinished shark. And we are, yeah, <laughs> we've been given a glimpse of the real thing. Can I stop here and then begin to share with you where it is that we are going? Ladies and gentlemen, we are, today is day number 14 of our prayer and fasting season. But also we are in a pivotal month because we began at the beginning of July, um, um, the, the, la the next half of 2024. Uh, and often we go through seasons of life where we, we, we get to a place that seems like a stopover. And sometimes in that place we can want to chill or to rest. Uh, but it's not the real deal. Um, and so here in Scripture, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and he says, we've been given a glimpse of the real thing. Our true home, our resurrection bodies, then he says, the Spirit of God whets our appetites by giving us a test of what is ahead. It's coming. You'll see it in a minute. Is it there? It's coming. Yeah. The Spirit of God whets our appetite by giving us a test of what's ahead, and he puts a little heaven in our hearts so that, ladies and gentlemen, did you see that? So that we will never settle for less. I need you to preach with a preacher and say to your neighbor, we will never settle for less. No, you're not preaching well. The preacher is preaching better than you. Tell somebody somewhere, we'll never settle for less. If you're online, begin to say in the chat, you will never settle for less. Come on, somebody. Never ever settle for less. Yeah, we'll never settle for less because chances are that somewhere in your journey of destiny, you've settled for your mediocrity. But today God comes to awaken us with a message, never settle for less. Not takers are history makers. 
And so write down your title and say, never settle for less. Yeah, I love this, this portion of scripture because it awakens me up to realize that there is more that God has prepared for me. I, I am here to bring a message in the middle of the year. I'm here to bring a message in the season of your time. Don't settle for less. There is more in your life. There is more that God has granted and guaranteed for you. There is more in you. There is more. You haven't yet seen it, but I submit to you there is more. Do not dare settle for less. I'm telling you, there is more in each of you hearing me today. I love the scripture. Many of you love it. Many of you have memorized it. It's Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11 begins to tell us that God knows the plans that he has for me. You know that he has for you plans to prosper you. Come on, somebody. Plans to prosper you. Plans to... That's what he says. This is, this is God's word on the subject. Ah, uh, no, 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 no. And yes, 11. Give me 11. Okay, let's start here. For thus says the Lord, after, okay, yeah, okay, let's go to 11. It says 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Other versions say the plans that I have towards you, says the Lord. The thoughts of peace are not evil. To give you a future and a hope. Would you kindly change the visual and give me any other visual that you come up with quickly? Uh, because he says, I know the thoughts. God is thinking thoughts towards you. Did you know you are made in God's likeness? Just like your mind is tripartite. Now I know why I said what I said. Uh, God's thoughts are on you, of you. Uh, you know, threefold. They, are of the, they, they know where the past has been. They don't, they forget your sin because you've accepted him and if you haven't you know uh he's able so he says i know what i'm doing i have it all planned out ooh, woo, woo, woo. plans to take care of you not to abandon you plans to give you a future the future you hope for that's what he says you know so often ladies and gentlemen we run out of steam and we settle for less but the notion of never settling for less tells me something, you know, powerful. It reminds me that I should never, not now, not ever. If I don't settle now, I shouldn't settle tomorrow. I shouldn't settle the next week. That means I should never. One of your maxims in life ought to be never settle for less. Because your God thinks great thoughts towards you. And so this teaching comes in the middle of your fasting season to awaken you to say, I can't allow chapatis to steal my destiny. I can't allow a plate of food to make me comfortable. I, can, I have got to see beyond. I've got to go beyond and never settle for less. Somebody at their workplace today will go out with an understanding that I am not going to go settling for less. You know, when you settle for less, you produce less. But when you go farther and believe for the best, our God is an excellent God. Hallelujah. Mm, I will never settle for less. Many times at the beginning of the year, we start with enthusiasm. We start 40-day prayer and fasting. Shakataya robokoseteka. You know, we are fasting 40 days or whichever number of days, and we have this vision of what the year is going to look like. And somewhere in the middle of the year, we run out of steam. We ran out of fervor. We were reading God's word. You know, when you check your U version app, it was busy at the beginning of the year. What happened? The Paul writes to the church, I forget, I think it's Galatians, and it says, Who bewitched you? Yeah. What happened? What happened? Don't run out of steam. Maybe it's dreams you've had. Maybe it's aspirations that God has impressed on, the, on your spirit. Don't run 
out of steam. Hallelujah. Don't fall for mediocrity. You know, sometimes we go through seasons and we started with enthusiasm, we started with passion, we started with excitement. You know, when we got married, we were like, my goodness, my goodness, you had it all together. But I'm trying to tell you, don't settle for less just because you are in your, give me a year, in your 20th year of marriage. Don't settle for less. There is more in the inside of you. There is more that God wants to do through each one under the sound of my voice. And as I was praying about this word, what I heard God say is, awaken my people. There is warriors in them. There is lions in them. There are hearts of victors in them. God is calling and looking out for you and wondering why are you a weakling yet you're supposed to be a victor. Why have you taken on the posture of a victim yet I've created you to be more than a conqueror. There is greatness on the inside of each and every one of you to be awakened never to settle for less. Somebody say hallelujah. It's in the portion of Genesis 11 where we are going. Genesis 11 and verse 27, out of the New King James Version. I will begin from 27, read down to verse 32. We may share another version somewhere in there, but let's begin to read and hear what God's Word says. Are you ready? Mm, 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 mm. So what it says. It says, this is the genealogy of terror. Ladies and gentlemen, whenever God is doing something, He likes to do it in generations. There are things God has been looking to do in your bloodline and he's looking for a man or a woman he can stand with and can believe never to settle for less. Ah! May you be that woman. May you be that man that will rise up and say, I draw the line. There are people that lived before me, God bless their hearts, but I would like to live a life that never settles for less. So in scripture, verse 27, God is beginning to tell us about a man that should have carried it. You know this story. It's the story of the father of Abraham. Now, we, his name is Terah, and we are told this is what Terah's story was, the genealogy. So Terah begot Abram, and Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot... Ah, you're not reading with me. Let's work together. Haran begot... Lord, let's read on to the next verse. This is what we are told in verse 28. In verse 28, we are told that Haran, the son of Terah, are you working with me, now dies before his father. This is a misfortune that should not happen to you. You know, it is not a good thing, um, you know, to die young. You know, it's not a good thing to die young because there is things that God has created in you that by the time you are done with life, you should die empty. You shouldn't die full of potential. So Haran died young. He died full of potential, but we never got to know what he could do or could not do. So Haran died young. He died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur, of the Chaldeans. Are you there somewhere? Okay, so let's read on in verse 29. Then Abraham and Nahor took wives. The name of Abraham's wife was, and the name of Nahor's wife was, the daughter of Haran's, the, of the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iska. Verse 20, 30. In verse 30 now, we are told that, but Sarai, this is the problem. We have a problem. Sarai was barren and she had no child. I'm here to stop and say that every time God has a great destiny for you, he will bring a small challenge that looks like a humongous challenge. You'll discover that you will be born out of a very broken family you'll discover that you come from a very disadvantaged, humble background. I use the word humble with careful thought because there is another word I wanted to use. And now you know which kinds of words I was going to use. You know? But you'll, you'll wonder, why me? Why me, God? Why do I come from this scenario? Why do I come from... But listen, the greater the destiny, the greater the challenge. 
So we are faced with a small problem, and maybe it sounds big, but it is a small problem to God because it says Sarai was barren and she had no child. This is still in the land of Ur of the Chaldeans. We have a challenge. We have a challenge that you didn't go to school. You're not so well educated to the best of your ability. But yet we know that you carry great destiny. We have a challenge that your current position in work is very weird. It's, uh, it's below, you know, the level of consideration. But yet we know there is greatness on the inside of you. We have a problem. We have a problem because right now you're trying to, you, your landlord is almost throwing you out of the house, yet you carry great destiny. And you're wondering, why me? I'm here to tell you, there is greatness on the inside of you. Don't let the voices of the naysayers take the day. Don't let them all do the trash talking. Ah, listen to what God has to say. There is greatness in you and you should never settle for less. So in verse 31, and this is where we're going to land and make, you know, our, our meal for the day. In verse 31, the Bible tells us about this guy called Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahur and Haran, uh, that, that when Haran died and when Sarah was barren in that land, he received an instruction from the Lord to say, go to the promised land. I'll take you somewhere. And the Bible says he, Terah, took his son Abraham and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran and his daughter-in-law Sarai, and his, and his, uh, Sarai, his son Abraham's wife. And they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans. I want to stay there for a minute and tell you that don't think it's a light thing for you to convince your son who has a wife that now let's live here. Let's go to a place that God told me to take you. Let's go. Let's go to the promise, the land of promise. There is a future, a great destiny. We can't settle for Ur of the Chaldeans. There is a great land that God has given this household. Come, let's go with me. Come, you know, come with me. Pick up your family. Pick up your belongings. Get your tent, uh, poles. We are going far. We are going far. And so he sold this vision to this son of his, Abraham. He wasn't a young man. He was about 65 of years of age at the time. He had a wife, and that's how you know that the wife was barren because, you know, how can you know except it's been long enough? Are we together? So now they are going to the land of promise. I'm here to submit to somebody that there is a land that God has prepared for you. That's literally and that's illustratively. There is a land that God has prepared for you somewhere. Oh, in that land is your place of favor. In that geographical location is your place of prosperity. In that place, there is your place between here and there. But when you get to your there, you fulfill your purpose at a whole other level. You're there. God has blessed people to help you in your place called there. And it was the place of promise called the land of Canaan. But verse 32, so they go to the land of Canaan, still 31, and they came to a place, yeah, yeah, give me that, give me that part that you had given me. They go to the place called Haran. They were going, but they met a city in between. The city was called Haran. They were going to Canaan, to go to the land called Canaan to go to their promise, to go to the promise that God gave Terah. And they came to a place called Haran, and they dwelt there. I'd like to change the visual a little bit and ask you for the NLT, if you don't mind, of this verse. In the NLT version, it says this, that one day, one day Terah takes his son Abraham, his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abraham's wife, and his grandson Lot. This is the one day for you where there, there were, you began your journey, your project with a lot of steam. You began your journey, your year with a lot. There, there comes a day where you're sailing vision like 
crazy. You're telling people that understand that I'm going to build this house. I'm going to put, you know, all of this on that acreage. I plan to do this. You know, you're telling people you have a business plan and you're telling them there is this idea that God gave me. This is what I intend to do with the idea. This is when the one day you're telling people about your dream marriage and you're telling them this is what I see. I'd like to go into your that one day and call you back to a place of remembrance and say what happened along the way because one day for terror took his son and he went Abraham and they began to go to the land called Canaan it was the land of promise it was the land that would flow with milk and honey it was the land where things would be okay and terror takes his son Abraham and he takes Sarai as well and he takes the grandson Lot and the Bible said that they moved away from all of the Chaldeans and they were headed for the land of promise called Canaan. But they stopped at Haran and settled there. Ladies and gentlemen, a couple of days ago, we were talking about divine settlement. But today we are talking about people that settle there. There is halfway between your here and your there. They settled. Ask your neighbor for me, where have you settled? Yeah, where have you settled? Where have you settled? Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, this man we know today to have been the father of faith called Abraham. It could have been Haran. Because in verse 32, I want you to see verse 32. Because her, you know, Terah, when he moved and settled in Haran, the Bible tells us in verse 32, you're about to see it, it's coming in a minute. The Bible says that so the days of Terah, in other words, the years, the years, he lived 205 years, and Terah did not reach. He died in Haran. God has had mercy on us because he's bringing this word at the right time. That we will not die in our Haran, but that we will run the race to our promised land. That you run the race to your destiny, that you run the race to your purpose. That you'll understand that there are things God intended to do for you in a season called 2024. And that you run the race towards the finish line. Hallelujah. Mm. Mm, mm. I want you to know, some of you probably have been, you know, there's so many names there, you've not noticed this, that Terah's son was Abraham and Nahur and, and Haran. And so he comes to a place called, so the name of the place he settled was the same name that he had given to his son. It is possible that when he got here, emotions were brewed. The memory of the past was triggered. And he said, mm -mm, let me hold on to this city called Haran. After all, I used to have a son called Haran. What have you settled with that reminds you of your past loss? And so he gets to Haran and he settles there. It is possible that, you know, when the enemy can't stop you from going, he will wait for you to reach to your place called there and distract you. When the enemy can't stop you from seeing the vision, he will wait for you to go a little while. And while you are in between your there, he will try to distract you. He'll try to distract you with many things. He'll try to distract you with the past. He'll try to distract you with a broken relationship. He'll try to distract you with offense. He'll try to distract you with social media. He'll try to distract you with all these influences you see online and you'll wonder, am I really all that that I thought I was supposed to be? Don't settle halfway there. Don't settle for mediocre results. Maybe some of you thinking, maybe the man settled in Iran because he was old. He was just like so tired and he was old. He even had a grandson. He lived for 205 years. I want you to know he wasn't old at all. Don't let age 
limit your settling. I mean, don't let age convince you to settle in your there. Because listen, we know from scripture and from Bible study that he lived in Haran for 70 years. Some of you have written off some things because you think you're too old. Yesterday, a mother of faith, a mother of one of us here, got married. You know, she attended our wedding 10 years ago. On her birthday, it was her wedding, and she was 50. So yesterday, she got married. You do the math. You know, and some of you have discounted yourself. I don't know what you think you are. That thing that you think is too old for you to get, God is saying it's never about age. Because you're limiting God because you think God lives in time. He lives in eternity. It's never about age. There's a guy called Smith Wigglesworth, and some of you know about him. He's a He's a revivalist, you know, he did so many things and some of you have read his stories, but you, I want you to know that when he was retiring, he was, you know, a, a plumber and he was just tired of doing what he was doing. He was old and he was retiring and God places such a huge burden and a great anointing and a great assignment on this retired plumber and Smith Wigglesworth does so much more in his retirement than he ever did in his career. You are never too old to receive from God. Why settle for less? Don't settle for less, ladies and gentlemen. Hear me. Whatever God said to you is still possible. Because, you know, uh, he's the God. When you think you have thought, he supersedes your thinking. You know, in Deuteronomy 1 and verse 10, he says, May the Lord of your fathers... Make you a thousand times more numerous than you current, uh, currently are. When you think you've thought your greatest thought, then he makes you a thousand times more. My goodness. When you think you have, you know, God said to us at the beginning of the year that this is the year to become fruitful and to multiply. This is the year to be exponential. You know, God promised that thing. And we're still believing it for you, for each one of us. Some of us have tasted a glimpse of it but not yet the full of it. And so don't settle for the glimpse that you've seen because there is still more. Hallelujah. Some of us, you know, when we have, you know, when we have potential, you know, some of us come out and say, you know, I'm, at least I'm not like them. At least I no longer do what I used to do. But listen, don't settle in the halfway there. Your potential is greater and God is obligated only to his word, not to your potential. Your potential is a part of the deal to realize that I'm just halfway there. I must rise up and begin walking, not to settle in, in Haran and begin walking to my land of the promise. That means uh, maybe I may need to go back to school. Maybe I might need to begin to look at structured drawings. I don't know what that means for you. Maybe you need to re-strategize your life. I don't know what that means for you. But what I hear God say is don't you dare settle for less. The obligation is on you not to settle for less. Because on his side, he'll keep his promise. He'll keep his word. Hallelujah. There are a couple of things that I'd like you to know that begin with your life. That there is that one day, the one day where it begins. You know, that, that, that one day comes in several layers of seasons of life. The one day can begin at the birth of your life. The one day can begin at the beginning where you give your life to Jesus Christ. That one day where just God puts a vision. That one day can be at the beginning of a new year where God begins to show you the strategy. That one day can be at the beginning of a ministry or a career. That one day, it begins somewhere. And there is a one day where the vision is clear. The direction is clear. And so I just want to begin by saying, number one truth that you must notice that the journey begins with a vision. 
The journey begins with a vision. He tells Terah, go to the land of promise called Canaan. There, you know, I'll, I'll bless you, I'll keep you, I'll, I'll make you prosperous. And Terah hears it and sells this same vision to Abraham, sells this same vision to his son, to his son, to daughters-in-law, to the grandson, and says, let's go. I'm here to talk to somebody today that carries a great dream. I'm here to talk to somebody today that carries a great career. I'm here to talk to somebody today that carries a great ministry. Maybe it's a family goal that you envision. Maybe it's a personal goal that you envision. Hallelujah. Maybe it's a prophetic word that God released to you. Makashitere Brosendekaya that it begins with that one day. Catch that vision. Run with it. It will not tarry. This is the vision that God gave Abraham. Abraham later, we see in verse 12, in chapter 12, that go to a place that I'll show you. And Abraham, unlike his father, Terah, continues and obeys. He begins to, to journey, to do something he had never had his anybody model for him. Some of you, the things you carry, nobody has ever modeled them for you. Some of you are going to be great mothers, great fathers, and nobody has ever given you a great picture of a great father or a great mother. You know, some of you are going to be serial entrepreneurs, and you've never seen that modeled anywhere. But Abraham obeys and goes. So Abraham now in Genesis chapter 13, he begins to hear what the Lord had for him. He begins to tell him, and the Lord said to Abraham, after Lord separated from him, lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are. Somebody here will remember, will go back to their childhood. Maybe they'll go back to 10 years ago. I don't know, but you remember that your one day and say, but wait a minute. There was things that I wanted to do. There were things that I heard God say to me. There were things that I aspired to dream of. There were things that I could become. What happened along the way? So God said to Abraham and said, after Lord had separated from him, lift up your eyes now. Look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. Mm. For all the land which you see, I'll give it to you. And then he says this one thing that I don't want you to miss. He says, and your descendants forever. Wait a minute. At this point, the man and the wife were barren, but God is busy speaking. You see, many times when God is speaking to you, he's not speaking to you like you are you. He's speaking to you because he's speaking from his own perspective. He's saying, I I, you see, your limitations on the face of the earth are just limitations. But from my side of the story, you are going to have many descendants. He's speaking plural. When this man is already way too old, his wife is way past menopause and he's saying you'll have many descendants. Some of you, you know, God is speaking and he's saying you become pastors of many churches. Some of you, you're hearing me and God is saying things about your marriage will become a model marriage to many other marriages. Some of you, God is saying, and now you recognize you're not even married yet or you're not even like you're in marriage, but man, God is writing your story. When he's speaking, he's speaking that your descendants will be many forever. Verse 16, he says, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. God, are you crazy? Because God is speaking about this vision. It is outrageous. My goodness, it's out of this world. He's saying that I will give you, I will make your descendants so many, so numerous. Your descendants will be as many as the dust of the earth so that a man could not number the dust of the earth. Then your descendants also could not be numbered. Like God, for real, I'm a hundred years old. I can no longer function. The engine just went to bed. What do you mean plural? Descendants, so many that the entire global village cannot even count. Not even AI can estimate. Ladies and gentlemen, I came to submit to you that it begins with a vision. It begins with that thing that God has given you. It is usually outrageous. It is usually preposterous. Uh, that's a coward that also me, I found out in my study time preposterous. 
yeah, I, I prepared to speak it like I am complicated. I wanted you guys to think I'm complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you can Google it or something, but just, just check it out. But some of the synonyms that speak about preposterous is, is it's outrageous. Yeah, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's outlandish, my goodness. <laughs> Listen, it's laughable because when people look at you, they see your current condition. They recognize there is no way this is going to happen. It's unreasonable. It doesn't make sense. How on earth do you connect the dots? Genuinely speaking, it's laughable. 2024, so God said you're going to be fruitful. You're going to multiply. You know, you're going to be exponential. It's laughable. It, they look at uh, Bambi, she's confessing. <laughs> Bambi, he's saying he can multiply. He can scale up. Well, <laughs> there is nothing. You know how they say that you begin from scratch. For you, you don't even have scratches. So... All of these things that God was saying, you know, Abraham received them. But in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 17, a phenomenal portion begins to tell us a portion of scripture that then Abraham, he fell on his face. I wanted to demonstrate, but I wore white. <laughs> and laughed. He said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? It is indeed laughable. I like how God takes all of this preposterous vision. And as he's trying to communicate the, you know, insurmountable, the outrageous vision, he tries to communicate it in the heart of Abraham. And Abraham is like, God, you got jokes. He's trying to communicate it. And in Genesis chapter 18 and verse 13, he says this. He says, and the Lord asked Abraham. I like what he said. He said, why did Sarah laugh? Hmm? Saying, shall I surely bear a child since I'm old? You know, some of you, you know, even when God is saying things to you, you laugh at them. You're like, like let's be serious because... You know, God, God, I don't think you got the right woman. I don't think you got the right man. I don't think you know why. But I love verse 14, my goodness. It's in verse 14 that I begin to hear God say the same thing he said to Sarah. He's saying to Abraham and he's saying to you. He's saying, is anything too hard for the Lord? And then he says this, at the appointed time, I will return to you. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that there is an appointed time. There is an appointed time where God comes and according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have a son. Somebody say, give me a vision. Give me a promise. Mm, there is an appointed time. One of my favorite scriptures in uh, the Bible is Habakkuk. Some of you say Habakkuk. Yeah, Habakkuk, uh, Habakkuk. All right, this is what it says in verse Habakkuk 2, 2. It says, write the vision down. Make it plain on tablets. You know, as if God knew that you'd have tablets in that day and era. Yeah, God, God is eternal. <laughs> All right, some of you can write on papers, it's fine. He said, and write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he who may read it may run with it, that he may run with it who reads it. And this brings me to my truth number two, because uh, between the promise and the appointed time, that's where the problem happens. Yeah, because there is a temptation to settle. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a temptation to settle between the promise and the fulfillment of that promise. 
the temptation to settle because, you know, along the way, terror settles in Haran. I want to think that there was a, a you know, a destruction. Something came and it distracted him. It, you know, like conviction came and he began to say, but I lost my son. But how can I move away from Haran? Yet my son was called Haran. How can I move away from a broken marriage? How can I move away from, you know, God is saying, listen, don't settle. There is still more on the inside of you. How can I move away from a lost baby? There is still more on the inside of you. How can I move away from failure to graduate on time? There is still more that is written on about you. How can I move on from failure to get that job? Listen, there is still more. Don't let the failures of yesterday oh, limit your today and cause you to settle into today because there is a future ahead. Don't settle. Somebody say, I will not settle for less. Mm. You will not settle for less. My goodness, this word will resound in your mind when you are about to settle. When the temptations come, you will hear the voice saying, don't settle for less. And you will go for higher. Because in Habakkuk chapter 2, the Bible began to teach us and verse 2 that write that vision down. Why? Because sometimes it's easy to forget what God said. Yeah, yeah. He said, make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. That means that oftentimes you need to go back and reread what God said. The problem is you didn't write. So what? listen to what verse 3 says. He says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. But the end, at the end, it, shall, it will speak and it will not lie. Listen, the things that you're going through right now make you feel like what God said was a lie. But at the end of time, God will cause this vision to speak. The people are laughing. They've laughed at you. But God will cause the vision to speak and it will not lie. Now he says, though it tarries. That's where I want to speak about. Because there is a though moment. Because sometimes we think that the vision will come tomorrow. Abraham had to wait 25 years from seeing an Isaac. Now he is out of time and in eternity. And he recognizes that not even AI can count his children. Though it tarries, he says, wait for it. Because it shall surely come. Ladies and gentlemen, don't, don't, don't lose out at the, you, be, between the halfway there, the quarter where there, the three quarters where there. I like to put it this way, that 99% of obedience is still disobedience, 100%, because it's not really obedience. 0 0.0001 disobedience is still disobedience. God is looking to take you 100% of your fulfillment of life. God is not looking to make you half, quarter, three quarters way there. God is looking to take you to the promise. He says, though it tarries, wait for it. Because it surely will come. It will not tarry. God, <laughs> he said, though it tarries, it will not tarry. Ah, ha, 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 ha. the grace will be there enough to carry you through in your seasons of tarry. I was reading this and just, you know, like some rhymes started to, like, you know, sometimes I get like all like lyrical and all of like rhythms come into my heart. And so I began to say, but what was the problem with terror? Because he tarried in his season of tarrying. He decided to settle. Ladies and gentlemen, don't be an, a, a terror who tarries in Haran. Be an Abraham who obeys to go where he has never gone. Because, see, the temptation comes so subtly. It comes like a suggestion. It comes like, just check on TikTok. What are people saying? And then you go to read a notification on an Instagram reel, and you keep scrolling, and you keep scrolling, and you keep scrolling, and you scroll, but you had told yourself, 
I'm going to pray just before I sleep. And then, two hours later, you're still scrolling. And those two hours are never going to come again. Do you know you've just settled on TikTok? <laughs> you've just settled on a reel. You've entered your haran. And sometimes, and sometimes, you know, you remember a ka thing somebody said. And then that ka thing triggers you. And then you begin to think, ah, but what did she really mean? Because there's a way she put her mouth like this. She even as if was pointing to me. And then you begin to think and you begin to settle in offense. But what God is saying today, don't settle in your haran. Don't submit to that temptation to settle there. Because I want you to know this, is that when you settle there, you begin to worship your settlement. Could it be that some of us have begun to worship YouTube? Could it be that some of us have begun to worship TikTok? Could it be that some of us have begun to worship our fears? Because some of us, the thing that's limiting us from, from going on to attempt the best, not the second best, but the best that God has for us, is because we are afraid. And so we, just like faith comes by hearing, fear comes by hearing. We've had so much things that speak fear, and we've believed them. And the moment we believed them, our worship for those gods began. I want to show you a scripture. In Joshua chapter 24, Joshua was speaking uh, to the children of Israelites, and he began to speak to the masses in Joshua chapter 24 and in verse 2. He began to speak to them. Guys, I want you to know this, that, you know, uh, he told all the people that thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor. I don't know why he didn't say Haran. But he says this too, and he says they dwelt on the other side of the river in all times. I want you to know that they also served other gods. So when Terah settled in Haran, he began to serve other gods. That when you settle in that mediocrity, you will serve mediocre gods. Vive Church, hear me. God, God, is, God is not playing games with your life. When he, when he gives a promise, he's not just playing like games. He's not about to like promise and then change his mind. He's not a man to lie. He's looking for greatness on the inside of you. And he's looking and hoping that you would hear him. And he's looking and hoping that you'd rise up and not settle for second best, but for the very best. He set the bar so high. Don't try to reduce the bar because of the seasons that you keep going through. So in due season, in due season it will come. Ladies and gentlemen, run with the vision because there is an appointed time. There is an appointed time that will come. It's in Galatians 6 and verse 9. Paul is talking to the church uh, the people, the Galatians, and he's saying to them, let us not grow weary while doing good. Yeah, because it's so easy to grow weary. <laughs> uh, let me tell you, I know you all are holy and holier than thou, but I submit to you that there are times I've thrown in the towel. There are times I've given up. There are times I have fallen and settled for below the bar. And in those times, you know, I have seen the pain, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I've seen the the pain of settling for, for less than what God promised because there is a cost to it. So he says, don't, 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 don't grow weary while doing good. Keep doing good. Ah, ooh, this coward, eh? This coward is so easier preached than done. Because, you know, sometimes you can be doing good and you're like, but can't you see? <laughs> can't you see this thing is tight? Can't you see I am tired? Can't you see, you know, even through our tantrum in prayer, we come like a two-year-old. I go down, I don't want, I don't want. Says, no, 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 don't, 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 don't grow weary in doing good. For in due season, ah, there is a due season, an appointed time. 
you will reap only if you don't lose heart. And the word coming to you today is, come on now, don't lose heart. Pick up the sleeves, square your shoulders, go for it. You can do this thing. There is greatness on the inside of you. You can become exponential. You can fulfill the call of God on your life. Don't throw in the towel. There is a testimony being written. Don't quit on chapter 7. Don't quit on chapter 11. There is where the book will end. God is rewriting your story. There is seasons where it's called you are about to grow weary. But don't do it. Don't do it. Keep doing good. You will reap in due season. Makasete kaya rabozende kaya. Listen, in your season of doing good and it's easy to throw in the towel, in that season, that's when you're growing the most. Yeah. Because it's in those seasons that things have been tight and you feel like you're between a rock and a hard place where you hardly, you're struggling to even pray. But God is building your muscle. God is building your capacity. God is saying you can carry greater. You can be a great leader of many nations. That's when God is building you in your season, in that season when it's hard. God is building you for greater. Don't, don't even look at me like you've never gone through such seasons where you've wanted to quit on God, where you've wanted to, you know, you've said, I won't even go to church. I won't even come to crew night. I won't even pray those things of AMG because I'm tired. You people have been waiting for this testimony. It's been seven years of waiting. I've been waiting. It's been 20 years. Listen, don't don't, don't, don't grow weary. Do not grow weary. May the word of God be communicated to the depth of your spirit for you to understand that there is greater, that your story is not your neighbor's story. Your purpose is not your neighbor's purpose. How you will navigate through seasons of life is not the way your neighbor navigates. They may be driving now. You may be hoping on a border. It doesn't matter. God is writing your story. It doesn't matter. They may be married with four children. It doesn't matter. You know, you might listen. God is writing your story. Yeah. I saw this scripture, you know, many years ago while in high school. It used to be like my anchor scripture. It took me through seasons, tough seasons, when I almost threw in the towel as the papa of the fellowship at Ntari School. And I would be like, but why me? Why am I the one going through a hard time? You know, why me? And yet, you know, people call me the papa. Why is it that me, the papa, who should be leading scripture union, and yet me things are not working? Yet people come to me and tell me their testimonies. Papa, you know when you are leading prayer, Hey, 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 papa. And then God gave me this word in Isaiah 43. Let's start with verse 1. Verse 1. Start with verse 1. He says this in verse 1. That but now that says the Lord who created you, O Mohereza. Mm, that he who formed you, O Patrick. I used to be called Patreza at the time. He who formed you, O I am speaking the way I had reconstructed this scripture. He who formed you, Patricia, he said, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, and you are mine. That word encouraged me. That word kept me going. May that be somebody's encouragement in the middle of their year. May that, may that word be for you, somebody, that, listen, don't fear. God, you are his. You are his. He created you. He created you so it can't be this thing that the doctor has said that can threaten you. He is your creator. It can't be this thing that the government, the nations, or the weather forecasters are saying. No. No, no. He's your God and you are his. So in verse 2, he says something phenomenal. He says that when, not if, listen, in your between here and there, there will be a when moment. You pass through the waters. He says, I'll be with you. He says, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And that when you walk through the fire, hear me somebody, you shall not be burned down. You shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. 
I want somebody to hear me that when you go through the waters, there is a when moment when the temptation to give up is so strong. There is a when moment when the temptation to throw in the towel is to say, let me be here in Haran. After all, even me, I've tried. God will also understand. No, I'll pick up your sleeves, pick up yourself, and begin to walk towards your destiny. And it may be harder. It's in that time when you're going through the waters. Huh? When the power of God is so present. It's in that time he says, I will be with you. If you ever doubted the presence of God, check in your seasons where it's the hardest. God is with you. And through the rivers, Makashite, though the presence of God is so strong, he's there, he's with you, he's with you. Don't give up. Don't, don't, don't let the circumstances of fire or water you know, cause you to throw in the towel. They may keep changing. Weather will change. Weather will change. Because you see, when he spoke to you, it was shining and it was midday. But sometime it will become dark and it will become night. Don't quit when it is dark. No, no, no. Sometime this time next year, God will come through. Sometime, and that's not a time according to the calendar of men. That's a time according to the calendar of God. He's not in time. One day is like a thousand, ten thousand and ten. A thousand is like a day to him. He's not in time. He's, he's looking at us, wondering. Some of us are saying, but time has written me off. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Number three truths that I don't want you to, to forget is that, listen, ladies and gentlemen, there is a cost of settling. There is a cost. Haran is expensive. Yeah. You're going to settle in Haran, but there is something you're going to trade off. There is a lot at stake. I'll submit to you that at the end of the other side, there is an incredible reward uh, at the finish line. But there is also an incredible cost when you try to settle and take matters in your own hands. So many times I've done this and I've seen what I've had to trade off and I've realized this was not worth it at all. Sometimes the cost, thankfully, is short-lived. Other times the cost is eternal. We look at Abraham today. Abraham had to pay a cost at some point at the age of um, 13 years into this, into waiting. Before the, you know, before the 25 years, you know, could elapse. Sarah comes at Abraham and he says, but Abraham, are you sure you had God properly? He says, my baby girl is. Me, Abraham, I hear God. And maybe I like to replay that conversation and maybe Sarah said, but Ab, you know, A for Abraham, B for baby. <laughs> now you are awake. Ah, you guys like love. Anyway, so but Ab, maybe you didn't hear. Maybe what God meant eh, that your seed, your your seed, you your seed. Maybe not me. Your seed. Maybe you know I have this favorite servant of mine. Her name is Haggai. You know, just sleep with her. And so, Abraham, don't do this if you're married and you're a man. Don't do what Abraham did. He said, hmm. And so he began to consider it. And as he considered it, story goes, they, they begat Ishmael. Ladies and gentlemen, the war we still hear of today between Israel and the Middle East and, and, and Palestine and all of that began with that one decision of settling. Your decision of settling has a cost to it. You may settle today, but it may affect generations after that. Don't settle. Don't tr it's a bad deal. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for the bad deal. The bad deal is to try to get you to settle in your Haran, but I'm telling you, don't settle for the bad deal. It was the bad deal still, because this bad deal thing continued in the generation. One day, they, they were twin boys, 
Esau and Jacob, and Esau returns home and is like, man, it's been a long day. He was going through the fire at work. He was, uh, <laughs> he was uh, a hunter. And that day he didn't catch anything. He had gone through the waters. Maybe he was in sales, and that day no deal was closed. B because, you know, maybe he was an entrepreneur, and that, that season it was like a whole quarter. There was no LPO. Do you understand? Uh, and maybe, I don't know where you are right now, but I hear God say, don't settle for less. It might be a season of a fire. It might be a season of water, but I'm with you. I am with you. Don't settle for less because the decision you will make in the settling for less may affect generations after you. It's a bad trade-off. So for a bowl of soup, Esau sold his birthright because he's like, but I'm hungry. You, you, can't you see that I'm hungry? Don't settle for less. And that's the end of Esau because then we hear of Jacob and Jacob later. Don't settle for less. I like to finish with this, ladies and gentlemen. Some practical ways for you, for you to avoid settling. Yeah. I like to go through them very quickly, but number one is reconnect with your first love. Ladies and gentlemen, fall in love again with your God. There is a way you used to serve him. There is a way you had a passion for him. There is a way you used to pray. There is a desperation you used to fast with. There is a way you used to cry out and say, God, help me. God, mercy. There is a way you used to come to church early. There is a way you used to go and say, what can I do? You know, is it to what? Pastor, tell me what you want me to do. There is a way you used to want to serve the youth. There is a way you used to want to serve the young people. But go back to your first love. Go back and fall in love with regular prayer, with worshiping often, with reading of God's word. Use that app. You didn't download it for far. You know, use it. Open your hard copy Bible and read it because when you begin to read God's promises, you align with what God has created you for and you strengthen your resolve. Hallelujah. The Bible says that they that know they are God, they will be strong. Before they do great exploits, they will be strong. The reason you are weak right now and you're about to throw in the towel, could it be that your knowledge of your God has weakened? Go back to reconnecting with your first love. That's why he says in John 15 and 5 that I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear how many fruits? Much fruit. God has prepared much fruit, exponential fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And number two, very quickly, mm, this is big. Number two, surround yourself with encouragement. God speaks to Abraham, unlike his father, you know, he speaks, he speaks to, to Abraham. He's, he first spoke to Terah, his father, and he says, go to Canaan. And, and he looked at the people in, her, in, in Ur of the Chaldeans and, and the loss he had gone through and all of that. He said, I'll leave these people because there is greatness that I carry. And he left Ur of the Chaldeans, but he settled in Haran. Why? Because in Haran, he found the same kinds of people that were in Ur of the Chaldeans. But he had to break camp to go to his promised land. What God wants you to know is you need to find good community to go with to your promised land. Mm. Listen to what he says in Hebrews 10, 24. He says, let us consider how we may spar one another on towards love and good deeds not giving up meeting together ladies and gentlemen don't give up attending church don't give up attending crew night don't give up being in communities of great marriages yeah because you can settle easily settle in a community of side dishes you can easily settle you know i went to <laughs> You know, I went to book a, a room for my wife and I, and I was, I was with good community. 
I was with Mrs. Komunda. And, uh, you know, so the lady that was giving us uh, the room, because it was a surprise for my wife, um, you know, that's why you need good community peeps who can go with you to book a room. Anyway, so we went, and the lady who was booking with us said, there is two rates. There is a night rate, but then there is a day rate. What do you want? I said, what? He said, yeah, there is a day rate for people who stay during the day. People come here for the day rate. Oh, wow. So people pay for day rate. So how much is day rate? So they told us the rate. And so how much is night rate? And it was higher. But it dawned on us, we're like, wow. People go to these expensive hotels way out of town for day rate. Like the market has even gotten a rate. <laughs> Let me tell you, you need good people. You might settle in those spaces. Mm. Mm. You need good people. At some point, Abraham also, God told him, leave your father and mother. Go to a place. He had to break camp. There are times where you have to leave discouragement. There are times where you have to leave the naysayers. There are times where you have to leave normal and go for supernatural. There are times where you have to say, you know what, good community, you've been my peoples. I love you. I won't stop loving you. But right now, for where I am destined, be a bit here. Let me continue because I know my value. At one time, Abraham, you know, he got into a contention with the guy he brought because the Bible says Lot went with him. God didn't speak to Lot, but Lot went with him. And Lot saw great favor and Lot saw great prosperity, but he grew a chimango one time. And he said, me, I want the land that looks so. And so he said, no, let him choose. Because when your people, your, when, when your peoples start growing jealous of you, when your peoples don't celebrate your moment, yeah, they begin to be like, but how come? But we saw this Kagal. How, how can this Kag boy become the pastor? How can he be my crew leader? How can this Kag guy be the CEO? How can she be the director? How? No, 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 no. You know, I, they, they begin to wonder. They begin to, how can you drive that car? No, 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 no. You know, wait, break camp. It's time to break camp and continue. Find you some good company. Find, don't settle for less because you can easily fall for the narrative of it's okay here. After all, we are single ladies. Nothing wrong with being single. I'm telling you, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being a single man or a single lady. But, but, but my, my, you know, and God can take you through a season of singlehood till eternity, and God can make you single and happy and satisfied. I know so many preacher friends of mine who are single women. Lisa Harper. Have you heard of that one? Ah, anyway, let me not bore you. I, I digress. But listen. Uh, however, should the narrative of your community be negative, call men evil, call women uh, mistresses, break camp. Don't settle there. Go higher. Go greater. There is greater ahead of you. So break camp. Abraham had to break up. But number three, yeah, number three is very critical. Woo, number three. Remember God's promises. Yeah. Remember God's promises, ladies and gentlemen. Remember what God said. Reflect on the goodness and the fruit on the faithfulness of the promises that He has made. You know, this will help you reach that promised land. What did God say? This is the thing that I keep saying to people. That, you know, God said something. What did God say? You know, when you began this marriage, what did God say? You know, when you began this business, what did God say? When you are taking this career, what did God say? You know, there was one day where Terah spoke to Abraham, his son, and Sarai, and he said some things to them, that we are going to a land, a land of fruitfulness. Then he, they believed and they went, but they settled halfway there. What did God say in the beginning? 
That's why he says, write down the vision. Make it plain, easy to read, that he may run who reads, who, who reads it. You know, make, what did God say to you? What is it that God said? Second Peter, verse 1, chapter 1 and verse 4. He said, and because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. God is faithful to his promises. God is faithful to the things that he has said. These promises that enable you to share the divine nature and escape. Did you hear that? Mm. The corruption that is in the world through lust. You can settle in lust, but he has made a way that whenever you read his promises, you won't settle. Yeah, I, one of my favorite songs these days, you know, when it's in the car, it's on replay by a woman called Victoria Orenzi. It says, I'm standing on this word, Gideva. <laughs> so, somebody get a mic. <laughs> you know, we might, we might break out in singing. But I'm standing on his word. You know, Gideva means sure. <laughs> she, there's a way she says it. She says, sure, sure. <laughs> you know, because you know he said it. You know, he said, you know, he who said it is also faithful to make it come to pass. Ah, there will be a time where it will come to pass. Stand on his word. What are you standing on? Because some of us are on shaky ground. Stand on his word. All other ground is sinking sand. Stand on what he promised. Don't allow yourself to tread off for the pleasures of man. Trading off the promises of God instead of the pleasures of man. Don't do that. It's a bad deal. Don't settle for that. You know, get onto his word. But four and lastly, is renew your perspective when it comes to the challenges of waters and fires and those seasons. You know, renew your perspective. Your perspective of challenges, hear me, that the waters only confirm that God is with you. That the fires only confirm that God is with you. That the pain you're going through only confirms that God is with you. That the, that, 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 that the limitation is just to confirm, the, the, the current failure is just to confirm that God is there holding you. He says this, he says, I'll never leave you or even forsake you. So perspective matters. Change your perspective and understand that in your times of Pain and challenge, that's when you're growing the most. That's perspective. Understand that I might be, it may be hard for me, but I am growing in this season and that I am growing the most. Also, perspective matters because then you can remember the things. Now I know why I said that your mind is tripartite. You can remember the things that God did and help you in your season. We see this man called David is facing with Goliath. And he says, ah, I remember in my seasons where I faced with the lion and I faced with the bear. I was a shepherd boy in the middle of nowhere in the bush and I was tending to the sheep that my father had given me. And when the lion came, I split it apart. And when the bear came, I split it apart. Now who is this uncircumcised Philistine before me? That when you change your perspective, because David could have complained and said, why me? Why, why, why did my father wish me to come where there is a Goliath who is going to kill the entire Israel? Even me, I'm going to be killed. But he changed his perspective and he said, now, nah. who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Understand this with me, ladies and gentlemen. Every challenge that presents itself before you in a season of your life, that that's a preparation for promotion. It's preparation because David begins to say, what's the reward for me? What's, who, what's the reward for taking down a Goliath? What's the reward of overcoming this temptation of sin? What's the reward of every time there is a challenge, a limitation, a temptation to settle in Haran? Understand that there is a great promise ahead of you. This word is entering. Yeah. Little wonder David begins to tell us something phenomenal in Psalm 77 and verse 11. Verse 70, chapter 77 and verse 11, he says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Ha. You know, sometimes you remember how he came through for you for school fees. 
Sometimes you remember how he was there in a tight season for you when you couldn't get a job. Sometimes you remember, I will remember the works of the Lord, my goodness. Surely I will remember your wonders. 12. I will also meditate on all your work and the talk of your deeds. Don't settle for less. No, don't settle for less. Remember what God did. That means he can still do it again. Yeah, what God did then means he can do much more now and that he will do greater tomorrow. Don't settle for less. Don't settle for less in your prayer life. Don't settle for less in your uh, ministry life. Don't settle for less in your career. For everything, all of life, don't settle for less. And we rise up on our feet. It's this famous song gonna get ask Susan to grab a mic because remember this this song that the girls you know and I will never come on where are my musicians at you're you are flirting my goodness get on key which key did I give you ah uh-huh Okay, get the master key. It can open every door. <laughs> All right. Come on now. We know yes. there's more that's found in you. Can we sing that together and make it a point? And we truthful and will genuine. Never settle for less. We know. There's more that's found in you. Father, we thank you because we'll we can't never, settle. And, and we will never settle for less. Somebody sing it. We know there's more that's found in you. We'll never ever. And we sing it even at home. Sing it with determination. Sing it with resolve. Sing it with an understanding of the word you have received. Sing it that I will not settle in Haran. And maybe for somebody that says, I will fight for my marriage. Maybe for somebody that says, I will fight for my academia. Maybe for somebody, I'll fight and still see fruitfulness in my business. Maybe somebody says, I am resolving not to settle for less in my prayer life in my spiritual life, in my giving life. I'll not settle for less. There is more that is found in him. Come on, somebody, begin to sing. Mm, mm, mm. Come on now. that we are determined not to settle for lace, that we won't settle for mediocre relationships. We will love 
and we'll love hard and we'll love well. We'll not settle for brokenness in our marriages. We will stay the course. We'll fight on the good fight. We will not settle for raising a generation that does not know you. We will disciple the next generation. We will. We are resolving here. Come on, somebody pray for with me. Make that prayer, somebody. What are you not settling in? There is a thing that you had God say, don't settle for that. Don't settle for that. Don't settle for it. Come on, go higher. Rise the bar. There is a standard greater. There is more that is found in him. Lift up your voice and make a prayer moment. A commitment not to settle in Haran. Not to settle in lust. Not to settle for that sin that easily entangles you. Not to settle for mediocrity. Lift up your voices and begin to pray. And we will know. We will know, Lord. We are determined. We will go for greater. We will go for higher. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's somebody who is here, and maybe you've settled in a mediocre relationship with your God. And today, it's a call that don't settle for less. You know, first things first, can you surrender totally your life to me? The call, he says, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock, will you make room for me? Will you make me, allow me to come in? Allow me to manage your destiny. He says, I know the plans that I have for you. I know the plans that I hold towards you. Plans to prosper you, plans to make you well. That doesn't mean you won't go through hard times. It just means that I'll guarantee my presence when you go through some hard times. And so maybe some of you settled for less, you are, born again, you had given your life, you had surrendered, but today you say, I would like to recommit. I would like to give and surrender my life totally. Maybe that's you, and you are here, and you say, God, I'll lift up my hand at this call, just as a sign of surrender, of living, of saying, forgive me of my sin, forgive me of my mediocrity. I settled in sin. I settled in the middle of somewhere. You know, I would like to renew my commitment to you. If that's you, all heads bowed, people praying, would you lift up your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. Pastor, that's me. I surrender. I surrender my life. Come on, somebody. God sees that hand. God sees those hands as they go up. God is seeing even you online. You know, if that's you, would you say today is my day of surrender? Today, I would not like to give 90%. I'd like to give 100%. I commit my life to him. And so today, I surrender my life. Come on, somebody. If that's you, continue. We'll wait for you. We'll wait for you. We'll wait for you. We'd like to lead you in a prayer of surrender, in a prayer of commitment, in a prayer of total surrender to the one who formed you, to the one who holds your future. Say, dear Lord Jesus. Come on, say that prayer with me and say, dear Lord Jesus. Come on, church family, let's say it together, even for you online. If that's you, would you pray this prayer and truly mean it? Say, dear Lord Jesus, today, I surrender. I give my heart to you. Take over. My life belongs to you. I give to you my life, all of it. I surrender my heart. I confess with my mouth that Jesus, you are my Lord and you are my Savior. I choose not to settle in sin. I go for righteousness. Help me as I go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. If you made that prayer, somebody's probably standing next to you. A salvation champion. If you're online, jump into our DM. We'd like to guide you on processes on how to commit and continue not to settle. Hallelujah.
I like to pray a blessing over each and every one of us here today. You know you're here. Maybe you are about to settle in or you've settled somewhere halfway. Maybe you had quit on your father. The Bible says that the effective prayer of a righteous man will avail much. God is looking to reignite your passion to that place of fervency, to that place of a relationship that is genuine and authentic. And you're saying, yes, that's me, Pastor. I like to pray. I like to pray a prayer that the fire will burn again, that the altar that you once had will be ignited afresh, that your faith will be ignited, your steam will come back again, that you run the rest with endurance, that you not throw in the towel. Father, I pray now, I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray in the authority of a higher priesthood for men and women here, for women that are saying, Lord, will that was us who are about to throw in the towel, for men that were saying we were tired, we were waiting and we were tired, but now we recognize there is greater, there is higher. Lord, we come back to the place of prayer. We come back to the place of worship. We come back and surrender. We come back to that place where it's honestly and genuinely about you. We come back to the place where we power our hearts out that it's about you, oh God. Spirit of the living God, begin to ignite their passion. Begin to ignite their fervency for you. Begin to fall afresh just like it was in the upper room. Morocco Senderebra. God says, I love you. God says, I call you. God says, I know you by name. God says, I've not forgotten you, my son, my daughter. I know your destiny. There is greater, there is greater treasure on the inside of you. And what he's saying, I'll take you there. I'll take you there. And so may you be ignited by the Spirit of God. Fire, fire up. For greater is he who called you, and he called you for greater, for a higher standard. And so, Lord, I pray that your blessing will dwell there, your blessing for multiplication, your blessing for peace in the middle of the storm, your blessing to be in the lion's den and shut up the mouth of the lion. Lord, I pray that you'll encourage that one who is going through the waters, who is going through a tight season, that you'd lift them up, that you'd encourage them, that they will know that you'll never leave them, even forsake them. Let them not settle for less. Let them ever, never, ever settle for less. For our God has called us to a life of excellence. And so, Lord, I pray that everyone here will live a life supernatural life of excellence greater results because you've said in your word that me and my children the children that God has called us we are marked out for signs and wonders and every man here under the sound of my voice was marked out for miracles signs and wonders miracles in marriage miracles in in, in education miracles in their in their career miracles in their productivity at work miracles signs and wonders supernatural a thousand times more fruitfulness on every side lands and property increase on every side in Jesus' name we pray and somebody here genuinely said amen and amen god bless you don't settle for less in Jesus' name